This is sort of our kickoff for revising the design review uh, regs and criteria uh, as part of the uh, uh, new city plan. Uh, the Historic Preservation Commission has been asked to do that. Uh, we're uh, working uh, uh, with the Design Review Committee. Uh, I'm Eric Gilbertson. I've lived in Montpelier for 42 years. Uh, worked for the state for 30 years. Uh, and I chair the Historic Preservation Commission and am vice chair of the Design Review Committee. Uh, can anybody from Design Review stand up and so people know who you are? Great. Uh, what we're going to do to, uh, this evening is uh, uh, Sarah's going to talk a little bit about the process we're in. She knows it better than anybody else and keeps us on target and straight and narrow. Uh, and then uh, uh, we're going to have a presentation from David Raphael, who's a co consultant hired by the city to help us with that. Uh, then we hope to have some input from the public and what uh, we're going to ask people to do is make your presentations very short and direct, uh, two minutes, so we can get as many people in as possible and not be here till all hours of the evening. So. Uh, and I provide, I'm the Zoning Administrator for the City of Montpelier. I provide staff assistance to the Design Review Committee, um, Historic Preservation Commission, and then Development Review Board. Um, and as part of this project, um, many of you are probably aware that last year the Planning Commission, um, was, or over the last few years, the Planning Commission was in the process of updating the City's Zoning and Subdivision Regulations. And following that, um, um, the city obtained a certified local government grant to really look at the design review district and evaluate its boundaries, <coughs> standards for review, and just take a closer look at it um, since this commission has that specialty. Um, so we obtained a certified local government grant last year, um, and then following the, uh, we, last year we spent a lot of time uh, finishing up the nomination for the historic district for the National Register um, and started this project, probably really started focusing on this project um, in December or January or so. Um, we've looked at, we're starting to look at the purpose statement and discuss the overall purpose of the design review district, um, the goals of the district, um, and we've hired Landworks out of Middlebury to kind of help guide us and facilitate the public input process and help us develop the standards for review. Um, we kind of envision this as our kickoff meeting um, to get your feedback and we hope to continue to have like similar type of events um, from now until August. Um, we hope to uh, maybe attend the farmers market or have some walk-in talks through neighborhoods and really listen to what people um, value in their neighborhoods, what things are worthy of protecting and where there could be some like leniency and some standards. Um, so the project, uh, it, we, our, grant, it, our grant concludes in August, so we hope to um, really focus on the standards uh, in the next couple months and looking at um, the different potential district boundaries um, and all throughout that obtain as much feedback from you um, as possible. So um, I think, and so other than that, I think, um, you know, we really hope that this can be uh, a community engagement and a lot of uh, public input and really hear from everybody. Um, we think there are a lot of people in this community value our historic buildings and the historic architecture. We also want to look at um, what standards for new construction and infill um, development. So it's really all encompassing and a, a complete analysis of the district. So um, we're here to listen to you and give you a little bit of history about the, what the design, when the design review and how the design review district came to be and why it's important and then really focus on hearing from you about what you value 
in your community. So um, with that, I think uh, this is David Raphael, and I think, Eric, do you want to introduce David? And then I will introduce Jamie. David. I forgot to say two important things first. <laughs> uh, there are cookies and cider on the back Very table. Uh, Kurt, uh, Sarah got those for us, and I think the members of the Preservation Commission could introduce themselves. That would be great. Yeah. Um, I'm Elizabeth Peebles. Um, I've been on the Preservation Commission for about two years now. Um, I'm an architectural historian that works for the state. I'm Greg Tischer. I've been the Historic Preservation Commission for a few months now. I currently work for Vermont Law School. Hi, I'm Jamie Duggan. I've um, been on the commission for 10 years now, and I also served on the Design Review Committee for I think about five or six a while back, and I'm also an architectural historian working for the state. I'm Jenna Lopachinsky. I've been on the commission since last fall, and I work for the Preservation Trust of Vermont. And again, I'm Sarah <laughs> <laughs> And uh, David Karras is also a member of the commission, couldn't make it this evening. but yeah. And Me. he's been on for almost two years now as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> David Raphael from Landworks is somebody I've known for a bunch of years because he's done a lot of work around the state of Vermont. And I'm going to just read this uh, short biography so you know who he is. He's a licensed landscape architect and planner with undergraduate and graduate degrees from Tufts and Harvard University. He is a resident of the Lakeshore town of Panton, Vermont, where he's been chair of the Town Planning Commission and Development Review Board for over 25 years and was a charter member of the Town of Middlebury's first Design Review Committee. Mr. Raphael is principal of Landworks, a multidisciplinary consulting firm in Middlebury, and uh, design review standards and guidelines for community <coughs> and developed award-winning town plans, zoning ordinances, and design review standards and guidelines for communities in New Hampshire, Vermont, and New York. Mr. Raphael is on the faculty of the Rubenstein School of Environmental and Natural Resources at the University of Vermont, where he's been teaching for over 30 years. Uh, and he's a member of the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Council and a trustee of the Lake Champaign Land Trust. So, thank that's you, Eric. Actually, when you start putting all those years in, I think it's time for me to retire. But <laughs> anyways, um, thank you all for coming tonight. It's, it's great to see you all here. And obviously, uh, I know several of you, so it's great to, to have you here. Um, I'm just going to back up, I guess, one, one step here. Um, when I started this project, I was really taken aback when I read this first uh, entry that uh, Montpelier is home uh, to the largest National Register Historic District in Vermont with 642 resources or properties. So it's uh, very impressive. And I think also I will make mention while I have this opportunity how impressive it is that you have these people serving you in their capacity because between them they have such knowledge and, and tremendous talent that uh, I think you are lucky to have these um, uh, commissioners uh, working on your behalf and in the interests of the community. Um, <clears throat> so as Sarah mentioned, uh, we're at a stage now in 2018 where uh, the Design Review Overlay District is being uh, re uh, renewed um, and provisions related to historic preservation are going to be a big part of what we're working on as, as uh, Sarah has mentioned. Um, I have uh, over the years collected postcards. These are not mine, but uh, I love the views that, that old postcards give us of our communities in Vermont. They, they really do tell a story and they really do help us identify what's here and what's gone, which I think is a, a, another real important consideration as we uh, walk through this. Um, what we're going to do tonight very quickly, uh, we've had our introductions, you've had your project overview. Um, I'm going to sort of kind of inch into uh, the presentation right now, but then I'm going to switch because Jamie wants to uh, show you some slides and uh, ask you a question to just, just kind of kick off the whole um, you know, process tonight. Uh, so I'm going to leave this for one quick second. Um, I'm going to open up uh, Jamie's slide here. Uh, give me a second here. Um, let's see. And I'm going to turn it over to Jamie to lead this, uh, this discussion here. So give me a second here. Uh, there we go. Okay, so we were just, I just uh, pulled a couple of images from around town, uh, kind of just to quick poll of the audience, see if any folks out there can identify some of these buildings from some of the architectural detailing. So here's a nice uh, an interesting stained glass window <coughs> above a pent roof, and um, 
sort of from a particular era. Any, anyone have any comments about this, maybe where this is or some of the things they see in the architecture? Are there prizes if somebody? <laughs> <laughs> cookies. 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 Uh, free cookies. To the, uh, I believe it is, yes. So go to the next All right, slide. Great. Oh, and there it is. That's okay, sort of in full. Is. Okay, next. So here's another one, a, a, a pretty sturdy building. It's got some iron shutters and um, looks like a secure place. <laughs> yep. That's correct, yes. That's right. one of the uh, buildings from our Civil War era uh, of uh, built heritage here in, in Montpelier. You can pull out the And this was a residence, correct? This is now a residence. It was originally an arsenal. It was originally no for kidding. storing ammunition. Um, that was associated with the Civil War Hospital that was here, um, where Vermont uh, College of Fine Arts is now. Wow. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, the the, uh, the metal shutters, of course, to help protect in case anything goes boom in the night. <laughs> Blew up. Or um, right. Here's a close-up detail of uh, you know a lot of different materials and some ornamentation, vibrant colors. Anyone uh, recognize where this might be? Same. Okay, how about we pull out maybe one? I'm gonna, you want me to uh, go, go to the next, next slide? one? Yeah. Okay. Ooh, I have a guess, but. My camera was a little wonky, so I had to adjust it. But. Anyone? Yes. Yes, exactly. Can we go to the next slide? Very cool. Yeah. There it is in all its glory. All right. Next one. So this is a downtown. This is a detail of a molding um, right on, um, well, I'm not getting that away, but, <laughs> um, but this, is a, this is a federal era building from the early 1800s. And what I love about it, if you read the National Register nomination, it talks about this molding being a, a rope molding. And uh, with some very simple tools, a carpenter back in the day, probably just with a, a, a hand drill and um, a blade, created out of this piece of wood, if you look, it starts to sort of splay as it goes down. And if you look at the corners of the buildings, it's actually got quite an angle to it. And I just think that that's a, it's a really neat way to show how, even with uh, early on, that the need to embellish these buildings and give them a little extra style and detail was uh, part of, uh, part of uh, what was going on in building construction. Uh, anyone know where this one is? Sorry? That is correct, wow. yeah. So if you pull out there, it's a Union Mutual. And it's one of those things where you kind of walk by and you just sort of see that cornice and maybe the dental molding, the dental blocks pop out more so. But um, when you start to kind of look at a little finer level, you start to see some of these fantastic details. OK, next one. OK, so now we're much more modern era. I, I could help by go to the next slide if you want right, to pull out a little bit more. Right. Oh. I think it's actually yeah, Union Mutual again, which yeah. so they are obviously connoisseurs of fine architecture here, but yeah, pull back a, one more time. Yeah, and that's uh, one of the few modernist examples of architecture here in the city. And uh, so that was it, just uh, Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you, that was fun. Um, okay, <laughs> all right, uh, back to uh, where we were, let's see. Uh, okay, all right, so I'm just gonna try and, and, and run through some, some very quick uh, slides here to sort of set the stage but and hopefully get through so that we can uh, you know solicit your input and, and discussion and maybe if we have time maybe at the end um, if, if anybody I'm going to tell a quick story as I go through this uh, but if anybody uh, wants to offer some stories we, we'd love to hear them um, but uh, I'm going to launch right into the into the presentation um, and uh, we covered this um, and so this is the draft purpose statement uh, for the uh, overlay district that's um, uh, been in, is in place at this point, and I think it's a it's a robust uh, uh, you know articulation of the of the value of design review and and the historic character of the city, uh, and why um, this is important, and and why what we're doing is very important. Um, you know some of the things that that we think of uh, with uh, the value associated <coughs> with design re review is it really does help maintain. Uh, the core resources and 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 the value of and vibrancy of its its rich history, um, obviously civic pride and sense of place uh, enter into it. Um, you know, design review also um, provides for safe, functional, and beautiful downtown. So it's not just about regulatory purview; it's about promoting 
uh, as we like to say in our business, joy and beauty. Um, and and the, I think the intrinsic uh, nature of uh, historic neighborhoods and, and architecture. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, a lot of money is spent on cultural heritage tourism. And uh, people travel to Vermont to uh, study everything from our uh, covered bridges uh, to our you know, downtown districts, to our scenic byways, and maintaining sort of the value and, again, integrity of those districts and those landscapes are what people um, come uh, to appreciate in Vermont, what brings people here to live and to um, uh, invest in the community um, and, um, and visit as well. Um, obviously, we, we can certainly point to, and, and I will in a moment, uh, to studies which show that um, well-designed and well-preserved and, and properly um, designed uh, buildings and improvements and renovations uh, do enhance property and property values. And also, um, you know, bringing back the original core elements of buildings and, and maintaining them, or um, landscapes and places um, really does connect with uh, sustainability in a number of different ways. Um, uh, you know, we, we don't build things as much to last anymore. Just, you know, all you have to do is go down and look at the big boxes and know that they have a lifespan of, I don't know, 15, 20 years maybe. Um, so th the notion of long-term stability and integrity, I think, is integral to the notion of sustainability. Um, you know, here's a great example of, uh, you know, uh, what design review or, or changing uh, and, and, and taking out siding and restoring it to the original, uh, you know, facade uh, and what that does to, uh, again, I use that word maybe too many times already, uh, the integrity of that historic block, which parts of which are visible in some of those postcards I showed <coughs> you previously. Um, one thing you know, I was asked to look at was what, what communities don't have design review and what does that mean? And the interesting thing is that around the United States, and I've, I've traveled all over, I've done research on uh, you know, design review standards fr from California to Colorado to Maine uh, and, and beyond, and most, most communities and most towns and most downtowns that have a historic core have design review. And, and have um, strong uh, design review standards and guidelines, again, to protect that which they hold dear and that which matters to them. Um, so this is not a, a unique phenomenon. And um, let me see that, yeah. So here's an example of uh, an, an interesting one. Far from the notion of historic resources uh, that design review helps with. Um, one day, uh, folks in the Lake George region, I mean, the, uh, the Chagan Mountain regions, you know, woke up and, and saw, I'm sorry, this is wrong. This is from Lake George, not the Shangan Mountains. Uh, woke up and found that um, the hillsides were uh, around Lake George were slowly being uh, developed. Um, you know, that notion of death by a thousand cuts comes to mind. And we did a visual simulation to include in the design guidelines to show what they didn't want, what was not going to happen around uh, the towns and villages of uh, Lake George. So uh, the fund uh, sponsored these guidelines and designs which are now in place and have been adopted by uh, some of the villages around Lake George. Uh, but Montpelier in Vermont is not alone. Obviously, we have everything from the first Ridgeline and Hillside Overlay District in Stowe, which uh, my company helped develop with that community, uh, to obviously downtown districts and historic districts and places like Brattleboro, Bellows Falls, um, Middlebury, St. Albans. Shelburne has a neighborhood design review district. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, there's a reason why these communities have enacted these guidelines and standards. Um, this is an example of uh, some of the information and guidance that, that your community has provided, and I think these are very, very helpful tools um, for potential, um, you know, developers, for property owners, um, and uh, you know, folks who are uh, poised to change their buildings. Um, <clears throat> some stories. Uh, quite a few years ago, I was working for uh, the city of Manchester in the Enniskeag Mill Yard, a mile of mills along the uh, Merrimack River in Manchester. And um, I had a, a, a meeting with uh, the planning director of the community, um, and on that day he was really in a tizzy because uh, one of the mills was about to be demolished, and there was nothing the city could do except to try and cajole the owner not to do it because they did not have strong design review standards or uh, demolition 
uh, you know, uh, guides uh, to prevent that from happening. Um, another, my little story, uh, which is, a, is, a, is kind of an interesting one, is in, in the town of Panton. Um, quite a few years ago, as we were looking at lakeshore issues and, and development along the lakeshore was sort of happening incrementally, uh, marching from both directions towards our little town of 600 people on the lake, um, <clears throat> we drafted a design review um, district uh, for the shorelands and, and identified where that would be. And it had provisions about scale, siting, landscape, contacts, things of that nature. The shoreline uh, proper owners uh, came out in force uh, against it. Um, it was coupled with a complete and much needed rewrite of our zoning ordinance as a whole. And in the wisdom of the rest of the uh, Development Review Board, which was the zoning board at that time, uh, they uh, decided to drop uh, the design review uh, process from uh, the zoning. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, a uh, gentleman from uh, New Jersey inherited a, a lot of money, uh, was looking for a place to build, found uh, 20 acres along the shoreline of Panton, and built probably the largest residence in town. Um, his garage alone is about 16,000 square feet on two levels. He has <coughs> 20 cars. Um, and uh, he lit it up at night, because uh, I guess that's what they did, where he came from, uh, with landscape lighting, washing uh, the side of this building. When Bill McKibben walked by that building uh, as part of the writing and the research he did for his book, Wandering Home, I had no idea that he had written this. I was reading the book. He devoted two pages to that home and really, frankly, uh, describing what, what a mistake and what a, what, a, what a, he said, he didn't say travesty, but I think that's really what he was thinking, that that had been built where it had been built in the size and scale uh, that it was built at. Um, to this day, I still get people cal uh, asking me, you know, how could that house have been built? Uh, you know, and I said, we don't have any, constraints or review process that would prevent something like that from happening. So that's my little story of what, what happens in a little town like Panton. Um, this certainly predates a design review, but it's one of my favorite slides of Brattleboro. Um, uh, you know, you remember the famous Joni Mitchell song, you know, they uh, paved over paradise and, you know, put up a parking lot. Well, in Brattleboro, the, it was a beautiful little pocket park um, uh, right on the main street. Uh, for many, many years, it was a Dunkin' Donuts. Story has a good ending. The town got the property back, and it's now a little, a little park again. Um, one study that I came across in my research on aesthetics and historic preservation was a very thick report done uh, for um, the state of uh, Virginia, the governor and the General Assembly, to assess what the value was of <coughs> aesthetics, historic preservation, um, and, and community design to the state of Virginia. And um, these little details certainly um, helped uh, support the notion of just how valuable and important aesthetics, design review, historic preservation is. Uh, real estate values uh, were shown to have risen 1.5 to 5 times faster in historic districts. Um, design standards and guidelines, um, certainly they found enhanced physical appearances and aesthetics and stimulated private sector investment to the point which 23, 23 communities in Virginia uh, recorded approximately $8 million in private investment in historic districts and downtowns over a 15-year period as a result of the, uh, the protection of those districts and their resources. And obviously they found that with tax credits and grants, uh, this was another incentive uh, to promote um, good design thinking and, and renovation as well as preservation. Um, in Montpelier, uh, the sort of design uh, control district overlay is uh, shown in, in, in this existing map. Um, I think Sarah has a map if anyone's interested of proposing. We but we do can have an updated map. This is from before the recent update to the zoning regulations. So but she does have an updated map, and I guess I just didn't switch that out. That's my mistake. Yeah. yeah but and and we're, we're not proposing a map at this point in the process. We want to hear from people right. and go through further, further development of guidelines. Uh, before we put a map uh, together. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, so again, through um, you know Vermont statutes, uh, communities have the right uh, to enact uh, special districts for design control, uh, for historic preservation, uh, for scenic uh, resources, and other uh, resources of, of cultural uh, and visual significance. Um, and so the design control district uh, in Montpelier is based on this uh, en enacting legislation. Um, but you can see over time how things change. Um, this is the original post office in Montpelier. Uh, this is obviously the current post office. Now, um, I, w I sense that this, the, the current post office is probably a good example of international style or, or, or you know, more you know, recent architectural design. But it doesn't discount the fact that, that a real architectural treasure certainly was replaced um, uh, by this uh, current building. Um, you know, this is a very simplified version of the design review process. Um, usually it comes through to the zoning administrator first, uh, whether it's minor or major. Uh, minor can be uh, dealt with administratively or can uh, engage uh, the committee um, or the commission. Major, uh, by its very nature, goes to uh, design review. Obviously, as you heard at the beginning and you know, uh, a local panel of community members advises and interacts with applicants in the DRB. Um, you know, one thing in our community uh, that we really stress, and I'm sure is done here as well, because we've talked about this, is the importance of that informal initial contact, is to sort of come in and talk with uh, the commission or the committee or the zoning administrator before you spend a lot of money, before you do a lot of work, and really find out what, what are the parameters, what are the, uh, and what kind of guidance and support or uh, questions uh, need to be uh, considered. Um, and so that's, I think, a very important uh, step. Um, and then obviously it goes through the review process and approval process, ultimately uh, decided by the Development Review Board. Um, some of the things that are considered in that review process are um, uh, um, for historic structures, um, are identifying the historical, historical significance and relationship to the historic context. Um, relationship to adjacent buildings um, and uh, how you know materials textures details um, work together or don't work together um, the overall environmental setting and aesthetics uh, of the area so you know if, if you have buildings of certain size and scale you probably wouldn't recommend to somebody that they if they have a vacant lot or they're replacing a building uh, they build something of a totally different size or scale there needs to be some you know continuity um, in historic preservation language, uh, it's often assessed as whether a building is a contributing uh, factor to the district or not. Um, certainly economics uh, come into it, and you know, uh, in some instances, if, if demolition is um, uh, something that does need to be considered, you know, hardship and cost certainly enter into that uh, discussion. Um, in reviewing standards, obviously, for historic structures, uh, the Secretary of Interior standards are sort of the national guidelines and, and point of departure, uh, but folks like you know, Liz and, and others know, know that better than I. Um, these are typical elements of, of design review, and I'm kind of going to just run through this very quickly. Um, you've heard uh, the considerations that apply to historic preservation. Uh, and structures, but in general, in design review districts, these are the types of uh, categories and considerations. Uh, design, you know, form, fit, massing, connectivity, design, style, finish, color, materials, uh, fenestration, and building entries. In the current standards, there are, um, uh, there, there are um, sections that deal, for example, with the importance of uh, a visible and identifiable and appropriate entry. Um, lighting types and location and intensity are becoming increasingly important. As I was looking at the old uh, Montpelier cityscape uh, book, um, obviously quite you know, old, but still very relevant in many ways, you can see things like um, uh, sketches for uh, future city state uh, streetscapes in Montpelier that include light fixtures that would never pass muster today because of our concerns for night sky, our concern uh, you know, for um, uh, energy efficiency and the like. But the good news is that lighting, and that's something we do get involved with, has become much more uh, technically sophisticated um, with many more options for effectively uh, lighting signs or uh, buildings or entries. Um, <clears throat> so that's an important consideration. And you know, these are sort of excerpts from different 
uh, design guidelines that, that we've been involved with um, over the last few years. Um, this is from Manchester, um, looking at sort of rhythm and scale. Um, uh, other considerations include site layout and accessibility, landscape and site design. I know, for example, accessibility is always a challenge um, with historic structures in particular. How do you integrate a, um, an accessibility ramp effectively into a historic structure without undermining uh, the qualities of that structure. Uh, certainly landscape and site design are also um, critical. Um, you know, with historic structures, uh, you might want to think about what are some of the historic landscape uh, materials that, that might have gone with that original structure. And there was a wonderful study on landscapes uh, and historic landscape elements uh, done for the Massachusetts uh, Historic Preservation Society that, that we cite. Um, signs and sign design. I was really interested to see the, the signs on the brick building that are kind of uh, sort of uh, arched over the, uh, the entry. You know, probably not the most legible signs, but certainly may be considered uh, workable with, you know, the shape and the arch and, and all of that. And then obviously we've talked about context and, and character of the neighborhood or district. You know, context, um, as I always tell my students, um, and in my practice is absolutely one of my favorite words. Uh, context is from the Latin word contexere, which means to weave together. And so when you look at the fit of something in a context, you have to ask how well is that change or that new structure or that development woven into the fabric that you are trying to uh, preserve or um, uh, you know, protect. Um, so that's a very important consideration. Um, we look at things like roofing in design review and roof lines and, and how they, they work, uh, work together. Um, <clears throat> uh, things like setback, that has to do with context and site. Uh, in Rockingham, uh, there was a real desire to maintain uh, the historic setback of the uh, you know, main commercial district. And, and those of you who know Bellows Falls probably can recognize roughly where this is. Um, but with um, you know, some infill buildings, the thought was you know, maintain that continuous uh, setback. And the irony here is that, as some of you may know, um, even in some historic districts or in communities uh, that didn't really, if you will, you know, dial in that, that pattern, uh, current setbacks in place, like in Virgins, would not allow for the historic footprint of an old building to be restored because the setback, <coughs> even in the downtown, required the kind of look that you see on the right-hand side of that slide. Um, you saw this slide. This is a wonderful example of how, obviously, a, a historic building can ch you know, change over time for better or for worse. Um, you know, the notion of human scale is, is also important uh, when you look at a uh, design review and uh, the, the experience of a streetscape. Um, these are two, now we're at the Shangam Mountains uh, uh, design review. Uh, these are the, um, some examples of guidance for uh, villages and downtowns um, in the Shangam Mountain region, which is uh, sort of anchored by the village or town of New Paltz, New York. And, in the, outside the Hudson Valley, if any of you are familiar with that area. And they were seeing you know, dramatic change around their region. And so um, 11 towns uh, you know, commissioned uh, a design review uh, manual to help protect scenic, cultural, and historic resources. And, and so what we used in this case was sort of recommended practices and you know, not recommended practices. And with each case, we tried to find and, and, and display an example of you know, projects done right or projects that we think work better. Um, one we brought from Vermont, you probably can't recognize it in the back, but in Waitsfield, um, in, in sort of the Mad River Green, um, you know, the buildings were not flat roof, you know, 20 year uh, buildings. They were buildings that tried to uh, reflect uh, the Vermont vernacular, and I think for the most part succeeded in, in doing that. And, and you know, to this day, Waitsfield still has that uh, charm and character of a, of a you know mountain valley village. Um, everything like everything, including overhangs and rake boards and eaves, uh, certainly can come under consideration. Um, this is uh, I don't know. Uh, this was do you know where this is? This, this is in uh, Bradford, I believe. Bradford. I think so. Yeah. 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 And I don't know if you want to talk about that one, Jamie. Uh, this is a project that um, <coughs> has an interesting history to it, but 
uh, essentially, uh, this was built right along, I think it's Route 5 there, uh, going up. But um, uh, over the years, there have been a couple of different changes, and I think the most startling one is if you go to the next slide. Uh, I don't think I have it. No, I don't have oh. it. No, this is the only uh, slide I have. Sorry. There was a, a paired photograph for that where okay. the sorry. property okay. owner took that beautiful front entry door out and put in a very simple six panel Home Depot hollow uh, core door. Um, and so it's just a dramatic shift how the change of one feature on a building can dramatically impact the integrity and the, the character of the property. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I mentioned lighting uh, as, uh, as one element. Um, and so here's another structure yeah. that, um, again, Jamie, I don't know if you want well, to This is down me. in uh, south, south between uh, Chester and South Londonderry. But if you can kind of see that center section over here, this, this actually used to be an old cape right here. And it ended up getting elevated. The front door was removed, and I believe that's now a kitchen bay window something or other and uh, this is just sort of there are so many changes here that you can't you can't read or recognize that original historic building it's yeah. it's bit lost in all of those those changes and uh, it was actually quite handsome uh, prior to this but it strikes me that when owners buy uh, or, or people buy buildings like this they ought to get an owner's manual you know that sort of describes what the intrinsic values and the history of the building is so that maybe they're more knowledgeable of that one, one of my former associates said if you don't want an historic building don't buy an historic building right. so. good, good point good point so uh, that's kind of uh, as far as I think we wanted to take it tonight because we really do want to hear your thoughts and comments as I said at the outset um, we'd like to allow a little time for you to weigh in. Um, you know, if you have any thoughts or reactions to the presentation, uh, the project process, which I can sort of at the end of the tonight before you leave, I can sort of tell you what our next steps are. Um, you know, your thoughts about what is working, what isn't, what is missing, um, maybe experiences. Um, but as Eric said, you know, maybe if a lot of you want to um, participate, we probably ought to try and give everybody a chance to talk. So uh, maybe you can keep your comments brief. We can come back to them. But, uh, what is what I'd like to do is have people come up and tell stories yep. in a couple of minutes right? Uh, so we can get as many in as we can without staying for the evening. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'll start out uh, saying that uh, in, in uh, 1993, uh, the State Historic Preservation Officers from around the country came to Montpelier for a meeting. It was the first meeting that was hosted at the hotel after the Basharas took over uh, and had recovered from the flood. Uh, they were blown away by Montpelier. And these are professionals from across the country uh, who uh, do what I used to do. They know their downtowns, they know historic <coughs> preservation. They were just blown away by both the downtown and the neighborhoods just walking around Montpelier. And I think, you know, that's this, it's, it, Montpelier is a very important community uh, in uh, both uh, our local heritage, the state heritages, and the national heritage. And, and Eric, is that, do you think, because it is so intact as a historic district for the most part? And yeah, I think so. I mean, what is it, that, you know, the high percentage of contributing buildings in the National Register District, what is it, 86%? 86%. And, uh, right around there, yeah. And uh, uh, the fact that it's a walkable city, the fact that the neighborhoods that are adjacent to the downtown maintain a lot of integrity, uh, and that makes it a, 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 you know, a great place to live and a great place to visit. Both you know, people that live here enjoy that. Please. So um, we have a microphone up front, and I'm just going to do a two-minute timer just to, to be a reminder to allow time for everyone to share. Hi, Scott Muller, Montpelier resident. Uh, go. Um, <laughs> I would love to hear a conversation about changing the name of the committee to a Historic Conservation Committee rather than Preservation. And for me, uh, working 100% in urbanization. 
the city's a living thing. And if you look at actually the mission statement you have, it's also about cultural significance. It's not just historical significance. And so, as the professor was saying, you have to look between the buildings, landscapes, and that has really been decaying in Montpelier, and it's very clear that you have defined, or not you, but in general, we have defined the design district boundary from sort of a God view, rather than what you can see. Mm. So the city has now built its back to the river. It's a horrible parking lot. Shaw's put, puts all its garbage out back. That's the first thing you see when you look at the design district. Um, mm. The relationship with the river changes. The relationship with energy changes. Um, so as we have to modernize, you know, they turned that river into a reflection pool. That's a reflection of the Golden Dome. And we're losing that already. Now there's going to be a parking lot in that view, blocking the reflection of the dome in the water. So these are values that have sort of been lost. Um, you mentioned uh, the walkability of the community, the things between, the line of sight. If you look at any line of sight in Montpelier, you're starting to see gas stations pop out. You stand in front of the Capitol building, you look down Main Street, State Street, sorry, you see a little Gulf gas station sign right in your line of view. Yeah, it doesn't exceed height, but it's, it's, it's line of sight. It also has to be protected. The space between the sidewalks are turning into asphalt. We're losing all our cement and granite sidewalks. They're turning into asphalt, uh, which, which is just plain dangerous. So I, I would like to hear that discussion about conservation over preservation, keeping things culturally relevant, and, and seeing that city as a, as, as a whole. Thank you. I, Thank I you. should have said that ORCA is taping this. It's not being broadcast at the time, but it will be uh, put up on the city's website. website. So those of you who are speaking should know that you're being recorded. I'm Bob McCullough, and uh, I teach at the University of Vermont in the Strat Preservation Program. And for the Where's last the year or so, is it, is it, closer to the mic. Okay, yeah. for the last year or so, it seems like more now, I've been working on restoration of a carriage house here in Montpelier uh, that had failed structurally and that was in danger of, of complete collapse and loss. Uh, but this is the main point. It's easy to look at old buildings that have deteriorated and see just the deterioration and not see the uh, important architectural details that may have survived, and that's the case with this building. So the goal has been to demonstrate that it's possible to take a building that has deteriorated severely and bring it back and uh, demonstrate or really restore the craftsmanship that's an inherent part of that structure. And we're working with Elliot Lothrop and his uh, group, Building Heritage, to do this project. And some of the, the biggest challenges have been trying to preserve some of those really fine architectural details. For example, the, the image that Jamie showed of the cornice detail, trying to preserve some of those features all the while incorporating uh, accessibility or, and meeting uh, fire and safety codes. Uh, I think we've succeeded. There have been some challenges, but um, we're getting to the point where we're, we're just about finished. Great. Interesting. Thank you. My name is Kirby Keaton. I live on Elm Street. I'm also on the Planning Commission here. And I have a question for the group, if, if you guys are yeah. willing to take questions Please. right now. Uh, so one interest I have in my work in the Planning Commission is trying to if you, increase... If you get close to trying, try, trying to increase... You know, so one, one issue I'm concerned with is increasing housing stock in the city, of course. I, I think a lot of us are concerned with that. And Can we just pause really quickly? Is the microphone on? It's on, yeah. Okay. Can you hear? Oh. No? I can shout. Get close to it. Volume? Uh, I turn it up all the way. All the way? <laughs> <laughs> so again, uh, Montpelier resident, Kirby Keaton, also on the Planning Commission. Uh, I want to ask this group about, uh, with, with keeping housing and ho increasing housing stock in mind, how equity, social economic equity, fits into historic preservation. And that's not having a, as much of a background, nearly as much background in this as, as any of you. I, that's a puzzle for me, but it's a real concern. How can we keep the character we want, but also make our uh, community inviting to all sorts of people and not just, unfortunately, a lot of the examples in the presentation, I'll say, were examples of places I think of as pretty elite places. 
I'm very familiar with New Paltz, for instance. It's a pretty elite town, uh, in my opinion. So how can we avoid, do, do we have to accept that we have to have an elite town, or can, or can we, you know, can we, can we accommodate both of those? Of those issues. What, what uh, I would say, take a look at Berry Street and the grants from the Housing and Conservation Board that create, I don't know how many projects that uh, Down Street has done along Berry Street for affordable housing and historic buildings and done a great job because there are tax credits that are available uh, to reduce the cost. It's a 20% federal tax credit uh, and you can sell those credits to a bank because uh, then they can take them <laughs> and uh, there's uh, grants uh, through uh, the Housing and Conservation Board uh, for historic buildings and for affordable housing. Do you, do you, see, a, do you see a place in your, in your committee, within your committee to help people uh, meet the goals of the committee and what we're trying to do with design review while also saving money or making it affordable for everyone? Is that is that part of the process that you envision? I, I, I could go into it further, but uh, uh, historic preservation doesn't necessarily have to cost a lot of money. Uh, and, you know, the uh, we dealt with this issue before. Uh, does it make housing more affordable if you let it get <coughs> run down? You know, and get it to the point where it has to be torn down and then new buildings built. That's really expensive, both from an energy standpoint and from just a cash cost standpoint. Uh, I, I would just add, uh, you know, there are other towns in Vermont like Bellows Falls and White River Junction that historically were not elite communities or very wealthy communities, but have been able to find ways to, uh, you know, um, renovate and, and, and preserve uh, historic structures and add housing to the upper floors. And, and you know, some of it's affordable, some is probably not. But um, there are some good examples, but I think you raise a, a very compelling point. Yeah, the the uh, Aubuchon building is going to have some affordable units in it. And Kirby, there, um, city staff can also help historic property owners connect them with state, um, Caitlin Corkins with the state, um, who runs the tax credit program. So we're definitely o open and to help and facilitate that conversation. Um, we've also thought about having like brown bag lunch series of like just to give an overview of the tax credits that are available. So. I'm uh, Ben Huffman, and uh, I have a written statement which I'd like to read so that it can become part of your record. Unfortunately, it's five minutes. So if I'm able to do it, I'll read it. Go ahead. Okay. So the task of your commission is to rethink the city design control zoning. And I think I want to interject that we're talking about the design control district, the zoning proposition, not the historic designations of the National Register, which is often confused. And particularly as it, of course, applies to historic buildings. There are many aspects of this which deserve public discussion, but I want to draw attention to just one of these because it has consistently been overlooked, and that is the question of fairness, or rather the lack of fairness in how historic design control zoning has been applied to individual homeowners. It must be obvious to all of us living in Montpelier that we are in a city of old buildings, especially old homes, nearly everywhere one looks. And I believe it is also true that few residents are aware of which of those buildings are actually subjected to city design control zoning. So it has seemed to me that quantifying these matters could be of help, as well as illustrate my concern about fairness. In my attempt to do this, I have relied on information from the U.S. Census, Montpelier's official grant list, and the city's listing of properties on the National Register of Historic Places. I know numbers are hard to com communicate verbally, so I'm going to limit myself to only a few. Montpelier has a total of approximately 4,000 residential units, not buildings, units, over half of which are contained in single-family homes with the rest <coughs> in mobile, multiple unit apartment buildings. Of the total 
of 4,000 units in the city, 2,500, that is three quarters, are contained in structures built in 1959 and earlier. This is the same time frame used in Montpelier's listing of historic buildings on the National Register. Of course, age is only one factor in designating a building historic, but it is apparent that a great share of all cities, the city's residential buildings, might, might be regulated through historic design control, but are not. However, the design control zoning district contains only some 20% of all residential units in the city and structures built in 1959 and earlier. Moreover, in direct contrast to the city as a whole, the, distant, the, dis the district's multiple unit apartments contain 90% of all residential units in the district. The rest are single family homes. And here is the main point I hope this commission will think about as you revamp current historic design control zoning policy. Today, single-family homes in the design control district number 38. Just 38 out of conceivably well over a thousand single-family historic homes in the city as a whole. I believe this is unfair because, first of all, the owner-occupant of a single-family home is not eligible for the tax credits available to owners of historic commercial buildings, including apartment buildings for their compliance with historic building improvement standards. In addition, nearly all apartment buildings in the design control district are located in the designated downtown portion of the district. A state program which affords owners of these commercial buildings with additional government funded benefits unavailable to individual owners. Secondly, I believe Montpelier's design control zoning from its inception in the 1970s has served to benefit primarily the downtown business community. And that's just fine. It's not bad by any means, but at the same time, never has there been an interest by city officials in considering the consequences for the non-commercial single-family homeowner caught up by it caught up in an extensive and exacting review and approval process and its expense, which none of the owners of single-family history homes, historic homes elsewhere in the city, have ever had to think about when maintaining or improving their homes. Their homes down in the Meadow, Alp Elm, Upper Terrace, Main Street, on Town Hill, on Liberty Street, and First Avenue, and all the streets in between or the Prospect area across the river, or up on College Hill. And to my mind, this unequal treatment is unfair and simply wrong. But you have an opportunity to make it right. I'm going to leave this with you. Sort of a, can you hear me? I have sort of a soft voice, so I used a bell to call my boys from upstairs to downstairs. I wasn't a yeller. Um, I don't know how many of you saw this. Uh, it was a slide. It's called Vulnerable Vermont. It's right behind you there on the table. Okay. My house looked like this when I bought it. I had absolutely no idea that I was buying an historic house. I was a single mother in my 30s. I bought my house in 1987, and I just wanted to get a house with a roof on it. <laughs> so a lovely person named Margot George had the foresight to stop by my house, even though you can tell by my, the look of my, this is exactly the, you, if you come by, you can, you're all invited to come up to the top of the street. <laughs> and you can see, still see the windows, okay? All right. So my house is not eligible for pres historic preservation. I'm an ineligible house. But 
Margot George still had the human decency <laughs> to come and talk to me about historic preservation. And so she started me thinking. And what happened is that the previous owner took out the beautiful historic windows and put in the very best Anderson windows money could buy. <laughs> I mean, they, they're they still functioning just fine, but they're the wrong windows. And he did it maybe about seven years before I moved into the house, around that time, I'm not sure, but a few years before I moved into the house. So here I am, I'm going into, um, design review had gotten enacted, and Margot had the foresight to know that the Cliff Street community, which is visible a good eight months of the year from the downtown, um, was declining. It was declining in historic preservation or historic conservation, whichever I'm fine with either term, but because people were slapping up siding, because it was cheap, and were doing things to their homes that was just reducing the gem of community. So I arrived in 1987. For the last 30 years, I've experienced design review. Okay, when I first went in, did design review, I, frankly, I was scared to death because, you know, someone telling me I had to <laughs> take out those modern windows would, would, it was not possible. Okay, but what design review did for me was to give me some affordable ways to increase the height of those beautiful Anderson windows. By the way, m the previous owner not only put these big horizontal windows, but he added horizontal shutters. So it really looked, you know, funky. <laughs> and anyway, um, we took off the shutters, we added uh, decorative flower boxes underneath, we put triangles up above the historic windows that did not cost a lot of money. And so you go by my house now, and hopefully one day it might be eligible for historic preservation. And then they really helped me with how to re really re replace, restore and replace a carriage, a carriage facility that was leaning at a 45 degree angle. And um, so I am so, I will be grateful, no matter what happens to my community, I am so grateful to Design Review. I'll be the first one to tell you that it was a nerve-wracking process. I'm all for making things more economical. I, I think that people should have the, the uh, I don't think the color of your house, you know, within reason should have to be controlled. Um, I think there's new energy efficient windows that come out now, but I am just so happy not to see that little community that looks over the city go down any, any further than it has. And even some people are thinking, well, how can we, uh, you know, fix our homes so that they're back to their historical nature? And that's all I want to say is that uh, it's really worked very, very well for me. I'm very thankful for it. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Is this picking me up? Okay. Um, my name is Lily Fournier. I'm, uh, I go to Montpelier High School. I live in Montpelier. I'm not a homeowner. I live in a house. Um, and, but I love historic buildings. Um, I've done an internship with the Department of Historic Preservation this fall and into the spring, and I just recently completed the 3D Vermont Challenge, which lets you research a <laughs> historic building. Um, I, as part of my research, knew immediately that I wanted to choose a house because houses are where we live and as much um, importance that city buildings have and public buildings have and what they add to a downtown community or to the way the aesthetic of our place, you know, we don't, we're not going to go and sleep or make our breakfast for the most part in public buildings. We live in our homes and that's what holds our stories. Um, the building that I chose for my research project is on Main Street. It's 140 Main Street. Um, it's in 
what is now no longer the residential section, but was the original residential section of Montpelier. It's a big red house. It's red painted brick. It's on the left side of the street, or I guess the side of the river is easier to understand, um, between Kell Cupboard Library and the Roundabout. Um, now it's owned by Associates at 140 Main, which is a law firm. Um, but through that building, I researched the story of three families and was able to connect with them in a way that you can't without that building. Um, I think about a lot where my place is in my house and how um, I could be remembered through my house. With my research, I discovered a girl named Bridget. She is of no significance to anyone in this room or really even should be to me, but her name and her place felt really important to me. Almost done. Um, because I knew that in my research of a house in a historic building, I was remembering her in a way that no one else before me could have because she didn't matter to anyone else. Um, that was kind of all over the place, and I don't have time to really wrap it up. But um, I mean, I love Montpelier, and I love the way the historic buildings feel, and I love the way they hold who we are all in this room right now, but also when we go home and eat dinner and go to bed. Um, I think that's it. Those are all my things. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Hello. I'm going to also do this. My name is Ben Cheney, um, and I am also on the uh, develop design review board uh, for full disclosure. But Eric had asked me to come up and say one thing. But I also, and I forgot your name, or I didn't catch it. Susan. Susan. Susan Abdo. It was a real pleasure to hear you say that you came, you enjoyed your experience at Design Review, because I do find or that you were nervous about it. Because we actually, I think, make a great effort to try and make it not be a nervous thing. Like, it's, we all sit around the same table and go over your designs and have, like, a conversation. It's really not a, about judgment. It's about trying to help people make decisions and see opportunities that they hadn't seen before and trying to make it a better project. And so having hearing you say that, I really want to reiterate that we're here to try and make it a better project. On that front, I had the pleasure of designing and building the, uh, the deck space off of the Asiana restaurant on the corner of um, Main and Elm. And I had the pleasure of working with Eric. Eric came to the site and we custom built a door that actually like keeps all the glass lines sort of we had to cut out historic granite and brick to be able to put that deck onto that space and it's important to me that our buildings may be historic but they're not dead like there's new things that are happening and we have to be able to live in a city and have it become a place that we can all sort of still continue to live in and designs change but how do we make it so that it's still beautiful or attractive but not try and just remakes the same thing and so that was really important to me to try and demonstrate on that project and um, with working with Eric and sort of with design review we were able to come to that and it was not onerous it was not difficult and it has made what used to be a very kind of trashy corner I think a really great place I love seeing people sitting out there and having drinks and food and sort of watching the parade or whatever it's made for a really you know exciting part of town so that's my experience Thank you. Yeah. I like what you said about building not being dead, and it strikes me that, that Lily's comments uh, articulated how buildings tell the stories and, and bring those back to life. So I thought that's very good. Thank you. Hello, I'm Barbara Conry. I'm. Um, I live at 36 Liberty. I'm just outside the Historic Preservation District. Um, and I'm also on the Planning Commission. Um, and one of the things that was very important to me as we were rewriting the zoning had to do with older historic homes that some of our older peop our families are living in, actually older couples generally. And we wanted to make sure that people could continue to live in their homes. And so we were strong proponents of allowing people to take a historic home and without changing its appearance <coughs> to make it into a duplex. 
and when I realized I was trying, I was thinking about this today. My husband and I moved here in 1986, and we took our Queen Anne uh, house and made it two family. And it's always been a two families. And around us, they are not two families, but it blends in perfectly well. So we just want to make sure that things are, so that there is more equity in terms of providing more housing for people in the city, but within uh, our historic housing stock. Else want to make a comment or please thank you. Hey there, I'm Sarah Hoffmeyer. Um, I'm a member of the Montpelier Tree Board, and I think something that's really important is to get all the different boards um, talking to one another. Um, so, and I'm a landscape designer in town, uh, so landscapes are kind of my bias. But um, a 200-year-old tree. Oh, that is something to preserve and conserve as well. Um, the tree board, I know I can speak on behalf of all of them, would be more than happy to come out to anyone's property to take a look and to also protect it. Um, a lot of times when construction is coming in, the root systems, uh, heavy machinery can compact the soil and kill a tree very quickly. So I won't go into any more details, but anyway, I just wanted to make that connection of the boards should all talk and work together. and keep the trees alive. Okay, thanks. Thank you for that. Trees are very important. Uh, when Middlebury College was building its new fine arts center, um, several very old oak trees were uh, in the mix. And I never forget the uh, president of the college then, Olin Robison, uh, I ran into at a, in a, in a, um, at a, a sandwich shop. And he told me that we better be able to save that tree because if it goes, I'll be run out of town. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we, we actually hired um, Bill DeVos uh, out of, I think, Montpelier. Um, his company came and um, they did some treatment and it wasn't, uh, you know, absurdly costly. Um, the tree was sort of fed, but, but proper protection during construction is another sort of guideline and design to, to Sarah's. Point that, that really ought to be in a, a review process because you can build around trees, but if you have to protect them appropriately in order to do so, and obviously ideally stay out of the canopy um, uh, diameter uh, or beyond that. Uh, but thank you for bringing that up because we, we can't forget the landscape and the heritage that our, it, that our it, trees provide. It, it is part of the criteria, the landscaping is part of the criteria. I can't recall anybody ever wanting to take a tree down hmm. at design review. Hi, I'm Erin Aguayo. Uh, we moved to Montpelier and had no intention of buying an historic home. We envisioned a sparkling modern gem in the woods and that was immediately dashed when we told our realtor four bedrooms and a walk to downtown. <laughs> and uh, I got a crash course in restoring a massive, beautiful 1915 craftsman. In fact, I was almost late today because we were waiting for doors to be delivered from Ohio. <laughs> but um, I just want to stress the importance of thorough design review. Like you asked where Montpelier is falling short and you can work and work and work on this, but then your neighbor can think, oh, like I know someone who ripped out every window because they were afraid design review was coming for them. Mm. And. Um, <laughs> I feel like there are a lot of exceptions to the design review. There are a lot of ways around the design review. And I don't know, like my entire neighborhood doesn't have any, like we're not in a historic district. I don't think we're subject to any design review, even though most of the houses are 100 or more years old. And we were recently fighting someone trying to put in a 16 unit apartment building with no, I, I wouldn't call it a design, it was like a box. <laughs> And I would like to see stringent design review. And if there's w any way to help people who need financial assistance, I would appreciate that. But it would have helped a lot if someone hadn't been allowed to start dismantling our home before we bought it. <laughs> that would have been really nice. And I feel like uh, architecture is what gives Montpelier the special character it has. And every time we lose a window or we let someone knock down a carriage house, uh, we did get ours propped up by the way, <laughs> but uh, we really lose something that lends character and usually what replaces it is maybe not what I would think of as modern architecture, but rather a very economical, functional thing. Like, uh, where, where do you, you live? Because one of the things we're going to do in this process is 
look at the boundaries of where uh, design review is. So I live on Kemp Avenue or Kemp Street, right behind VCFA, okay. yeah. the Sabin, Sabin Street area, which is a lovely historic area. And don't tell them I'm the one who told you it should be under design review. <laughs> <laughs> you probably should. You keep it safe with us. So. <laughs> and public television. television. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, maybe not. <laughs> and I love the idea of a manual because we had no idea what we were getting into. <laughs> so thanks. Les Blomberg from Montpelier uh, Heritage Group. And uh, I just wanted to express another concern to which is that uh, the museum ought to be something that's uh, of value 50 years from now. And uh, that seems to be uh, stuff I've seen recently, a major problem, that, that stuff that's being proposed doesn't seem to be a much, much reason to save in the future. And I would like to see us make an effort to make sure that everything we are constructing is something that we want to be around in 50 or 100. Weigh in. Anybody else? Thank you very, thank you very much. And if you want to see yourself on TV again, <laughs> you can you can and do that. Um, one thing um, I just would close with, so you know what we're what we're planning of, uh, uh, you know, in, in a little more detail. Should I hit the light? Yeah, sure. this will be very short. Um, uh, you know, we're going to obviously we, we heard what you said, and we're going to kind of. Um, digest that and, and, and take that to heart. Um, and we are going to start now to, to review the standards and guidelines in the application process um, and then begin to initiate uh, drafting of uh, new review criteria and revisions. And as Eric said, uh, looking at the, the district boundaries and we do have a whole work plan as, as shown on the right in a, in a matrix we put together. Um, in June, uh, the notion would be to review and revise as appropriate uh, the second draft of the uh, standards guidelines uh, in the process. Um, and obviously, um, to the point earlier, we want everyone to be on board, and so I think it's the intent of the commission to uh, distribute to the city officials and boards uh, as appropriate for their input and discussion. Um, and then I think we're going to, with that uh, new draft um, in place, we will conduct uh, another opportunity for this type of uh, engagement and, and a public meeting. Uh, and then over July and August, we have to finalize the revisions uh, to that section um, and uh, obviously ensure that the uh, requirements set forth in the grant money to the city are all met and address the timing uh, with which the uh, new design review section draft is submitted to the uh, Planning Commission. So that's sort of the way forward. The project will uh, need to come to a close uh, by the end of, the, uh, of August because that's the time frame for the grant. I don't know if uh, Liz or anybody wants to add something to that. Please. So they don't have to be passed in August. Thank they you. just need to be drafted so that we're meeting our CLG grant requirements. Um, there is still the city's process for um, posting and warning and all of that right. that yeah. can continue on. So any, any of you that are interested in receiving uh, notices, particular notices of the meeting, uh, Sarah, I think, can put you on a list. Otherwise, it shows up on the city website uh, as, as well as video. Uh, I, one of the sort of, sort of, we haven't talked a lot about this, but the idea is to make the design review process clear for the applicants about you know, what they're doing. And design, design control does not mean that everything has to stay the same. Uh, that's one reason I asked uh, Ben to come up and talk about the deck. That's clearly a new thing. It's in an historic building, and it went through design review. Uh, you came in for a preliminary, right? And then, uh, and then for a final. And so that things can change. It's not we're not we're not trying to pickle anything. And uh, one of the I've been doing historic preservation for probably too long, but one of the things that's kind of been lost is uh, that when you come into a community, 
you should instantly recognize that community if you've been there before. A sense of place. Here's where you are. You're in Montpelier. You're no place, no place else. If uh, buildings get uh, uh, too much changed, you lose that sense of place, and people begin to wonder uh, where they are. And so, hopefully, we can do that and make the design review process uh, more constructive. One of the members of the planning commission uh, really saw design review and. Uh, uh, Susan talked about it a little bit. The, the idea of uh, we have a lot of expertise on the Design Review Committee and can uh, offer a, a, a lot of help to people about construction uh, and design. So uh, I th think they thought that this is, a, this is a resource that people could come to. And uh, as a member of the Design Review Committee, we're always happy to talk people's project over before that or probably even help people that aren't in design review. Because there's a lot of buildings, and in, in, in this sort of talks to Ben point, there's a lot of very important historic buildings and districts uh, that are outside the current design review. Uh, so, uh, but I think we, do, we will, as a committee, I think we want to help people take good care of their buildings uh, and do it in a reasonable way. And if any of you wish to contact any of us, uh, we put uh, Sarah, Eric's, and my contact information on the uh, on the slide there. Feel free to reach out to any of us uh, with questions or comments, um, by all means. Um. And we'll be posting this uh, PowerPoint up on the, the city's website so you can reference it. Um, take a look at our first stab at the draft purpose statement, which was early on in this PowerPoint. Um, and then use it for the contact info as well. And so, and just lastly, the uh, Historic Preservation Commission, generally they've been meeting the second Tuesday of every month at 6.30. Um, there are public meetings, and uh, from this, from in the upcoming months, uh, they'll basically be work sessions of trying to review this, uh, come up with some draft standards, review the boundaries, and so those meetings are fully open to the public. Um, the agendas are posted on the city's website. Um, and you can certainly contact Eric or myself um, if you have any questions, but we r really welcome participation and having that just be an open dialogue um, and getting your suggestions on standards and dis uh, boundaries, things that should be exempt, um, everything. So uh, feel free to come to any of the meetings or send us an email, call or whatever. Um, so this process and the project will be happening um, from now until through July and kind of concluding in August. There's, it looks to me like there's still a lot of cider and cookies left. Yeah. So, and as I think a conversation after the meeting with anybody, I, I'll stick around. So, thank you all again. Thank, thank you for you. coming. Thank, thank you, you very much. Appreciate the, a lot of people that came.